Hello and welcome to episode number 79 of the MR Running Pains podcast. My name is Aaron Saft and today's guest is Martin Thorne. Martin is one of my athletes that I coach. Um, I have the honor of working with this gentleman. He is 55 years old and still absolutely killing it. Um, he's, he's such a, a fun athlete to work with because he has such drive as you'll hear in this interview. Um, Martin is amazing. Uh, he just came in second place at the Stevest, a 43 mile race, uh, in kind of the greater Charlotte area, which was, it was blazing hot. I mean, people were just peeling off left and right and Martin, you know, just drove it. Uh, he, he PR'd uh, just incredible. Uh, he's got so much to share. Um, love, 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 uh, Martin and his, uh, his philosophy, uh, you know, and uh, he has, like I said, just some really cool things to share. As the title says, um, you know, he calls it running um, is a metaphor for life. So um, with that said, I'd like to introduce you to Martin Thorne. Well, my guest today, as I said in the introduction, is Martin Thorne. Martin, uh, we started talking before the podcast recording, but what's going on today? How are you? Well, struggling right now with a little Achilles tendon issue, but overall good. Miss, uh, I got my run in this morning, so the world's a happier place when I run each day. Um, but anyway, dealing with a little bit of that, and we're nine weeks away from my A race, the Chicago Marathon. So just learning to deal with things I can't control. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. Uh, and we've, we'll talk about some of the things that we've been you know, adjusting through your training. Um, but, um, give us a little bit more of a, a background of who is Martin Thorne? Where, where did Martin start running in his life? Uh, 2011, no, 2012, I went to the doctor and he, it, doctor was a good friend of mine in Salisbury. And he said, how old was your father when he passed away? And I said, 62. And he said, well, on the path you're on with your health issues, with your overweight issues, I don't think you'll make it. And so that kind of got me, he says, I want to put you on a bunch of medicine. And I said, I don't want to do that. And he said, well, we've been talking about this for years. It's time to do it. And I said, can you give me one month? And that day I started walking and um, started watching what I ate. And, and it's funny, you'll hear this theme throughout my talk here that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So I started walking and I had a little, my neighborhood was a, a, was a big square. And, you know, I got to the point where I'd walk and then I'd say, maybe I could run to the next corner. And I started doing that. But what really helped me and take it to the next level, there was another fat guy in my neighborhood and I saw him walking. So I reached out to him. I said, hey, can we do this together? And he says, well, I like to do it at 530 in the morning. I said, well, I'll do it. And that helped me so much in the early years of just having the accountability because I will not, I generally will not leave anybody hanging. And the fact that I knew he'd be in my driveway at five 30, got my butt up and it just built consistency. So I don't know why he came into my life when he did. I didn't know him from Adam's house cat, but we've stayed lifelong friends and it, it just running with other people helps me so much. So that's Absolutely. How, and as a result, I lost 40 pounds and got in great shape. And I've just always been one of these people. I always say, what's next? What's next? So, and What did that doctor's visit look like the, the, the month afterwards? Well, I had lost 12 pounds. And he says, I don't know how you did it with your blood work, but something's working. Can you just continue? And I did. And here we are. So, <laughs> Right on. So that's yeah. great. Uh, and it, you're right. You know, we are we're social creatures, you know, many of us enjoy races and we enjoy the social aspects of that. We enjoy running with others. I mean, you know, it's, it's not that, um, we don't go off for runs by ourselves, but it seems like when you go out for a run with others, those long runs go by so much quicker. Um, and speaking of which, you know, the, <laughs> we can talk about, um, your, your most recent, um, racer and, and long effort, um, the Stevest, um, can you tell us a little bit about the Stevis? Not every listener is going to know about this event, where it is, what's the format, how long it is, all that kind of stuff. It's a uh, fun format where they only allow 50 people in the race, and it's on a black diamond mountain bike course. 
So I think it's very aggressive. There's a couple of hills that go down way over 45 degrees and you have to use ropes. So it's just one that beats you to death. That it's 43 miles and it's three loops. And so um, most people, I think this year they had the most finishers at nine, but I've been there in years that where they only had three finishers. And so this year I came in second, but there was a couple of things I just did that I've learned from. Maybe we could talk about, but, you know, it's just a matter of, I, I have a familiar saying, I say, when it's bad, don't stop. And so it was super hot and I wore ice bandanas, but um, overall, I was real happy. I think I was uh, 11, 12 minutes behind the leader, and uh, I felt like I ran a good race. I, You know, there's a YouTube video that I posted on the Running Pains website, and um, I gave it my all. So in my mind, I won. You know, I am a competitive person, but only with myself. I would love nothing better than to be in back of the pack and everybody get PR. So I always... I never worry about where I finish in the field because I don't have any control about who shows up, but I know I want to get the most out of Martin. And I felt like at the Stevens with the heat index of 98 in the woods all day, I got all I could get out of this whole body. So and that was over 50 K, right? Yeah. It was 43 miles overall. 43. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, man. And um, you said it was a, a loop style course, right? Yes. Three loops making 43. Three loops making 43. Um, and so um, how many times had you done this race? Done it uh, twice before. I actually won it in 2018, but they didn't have. I mean, again, it's more of a social event. Most people plan on not doing three loops. And you get three beers with your entry for 30 bucks. So most people say, hey, I'm going to do one loop. But, there, you know, there's generally seven or eight folks that are going after it each year. So they right inspired on. me. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, for not being competitive with others, um, you know, I, I, you had those two to reflect on. Um, did you know your splits from those previous attempts? Yes, I was actually faster this year. Right on. Yeah. And so you, um, you were in your head. Did you have those like kind of after loop one, I need to be here after loop two? Well, it sounds good in theory, but I mean, after loop one, we it was so hot. It was a matter of, hey, I got to cool this engine down. So I started stuffing. I've got the bandanas that are sewn. And after loop one, I literally put two pounds of ice in a bandana and tied it around my neck. And that gave me like so each loop was like two hours, 15, 20 minutes. That gave me 40 minutes of staying cool. And then on the third one, I had, I literally had a bandana on the front and back. So I had like four pounds of ice on me. So it just bought me time. Yeah. But nice. yeah, I was, I was at least 30 minutes faster than when I wanted. And, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with, uh, I'm a big believer. If I want to become good at something, I'm going to find people that are good at it and just do what they do. <laughs> you know, and that relates to why I have a coach and you, I, you know, you, you've done or are doing the things I want to do. So my idea is let's not recreate the will. Let's just copy and paste and do it. Sure. Sure. Well, and you know, to that point, I mean, I, yeah, I've been listening to a lot of, a lot of other podcasts recently and they talk about coaching and, you know, um, what I do with you is not necessarily what I did if that makes sense, because, you know, what worked for me may not necessarily work for you. And I think that's the difference in what you'll find in coaches, because some coaches just try to replicate exactly what they did and worked for them instead of finding out what's going to work for Martin. Right. And so you're doing some different things that I may not have done because we're working on your, you know, using your strengths and building up your weaknesses. Whereas my strengths and weaknesses were totally different. So like, you know, my training perhaps would not translate as well to you. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, to that point, we started, you know, you sent me a video of your running form and we started looking at, OK, well, you know, an important thing is your knee lift. And that, that's one thing we started to work on. Um, now, hopefully, you know, we didn't put too much pressure and, and you know, I, you know, I, I'm thinking the Achilles came from that speed bout we did last week where we just increased um, your effort. And we, you know, we put you into uh, a spot where maybe you were up on your toes a little too much. Um, and that just increased the pressure on the Achilles. But, um, 
you know, hopefully we'll get through that. You do a, an, an awesome job of, of cross training. <laughs> I, you know, I, I've, I've not seen somebody attack gym so aggressively as, as you do, uh, cause you want to maintain that fitness. Um, but you find what works for you, which is incredible. Do you want to talk about that for a second? Well, and, and let me, let me be candid in the truth, in the world of truth. It's my fault that the speed work caused the damage because I generally try to run twice a day. So Tim in my running group, let me give out a shout out to Tim. Um, he said, hey, let's go do a little speed work. And I said, hey, wh- why not? So I already did a little speed work in the morning, some hundreds and two hundreds. So I said, why? It's no big deal. So then I did it again at lunch, a full hour, and that's what caused it. So again, I think your biggest challenge with me is just reining in the harness and saying, whoa, buddy, let's think long term. And even today, I ran this morning. You don't know how close I came when the lunch bunch called me and said, hey, aren't you going to come out and run with us? (laughs) I mean, I've got running groups that I started at lunch. And uh, let me give a shout out to John and Jay Owen and Drew. You know, I want to run with those guys so bad, but I got to think I've got to rehab this thing. So, you know, though I do have an Achilles issue right now, it's because I didn't I wasn't smart. You know, I'm trying to constantly do too much. I have a high sense of urgency. I'm 55 years old, and I really believe, even though I'm running the fastest I've ever run, I really think I've got an expiration date on me. So I'm just trying to squeeze as much out of life and running as I can. You know, one of the things is I broke my leg in 2018, and something you'll hear from people that run with me, I always say there's a blessing in every curse. And a curse and every blessing. That's something my grandmother always said. And because I broke my leg at Yorari, um, I went to the doctor and he said, hey, while we're here, let me check your blood levels. Turned out I had prostate cancer and I got that removed. But after having early stage four prostate cancer, I feel like I've been given another chance. So I'm not going to screw around and lay on the couch. I'm going to get out there and make that happen. And then the other thing is, I run around some graveyards occasionally and I always think about how I don't know anything about my great grandparents. And I'm always thinking about that's kind of a shame. So I'm trying to leave a legacy to my two kids about if nothing else, just say that was a crazy grandfather that did unbelievable things because he wasn't smart enough to know you shouldn't do it. And that's what I'm always about. And then People say, how do you run these races? I think I've run seven 100s. I always say you got to have a reason because when it's sucking out there and you want to quit, and I'm going to tell you something, the only reason I get through those races is I think about my kids, my boys looking at me, Sam and Teller saying, hey, Dad, can I quit? Because they used to love to quit soccer and other stuff. And I always go, hell no. we got <laughs> got to finish what we start. And so I'm a big believer, whether it be at work or with my children, you you got to serve as an example, and I just don't quit. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to get good at it. Whatever I do a lot of, I will get good at it. And if I start quitting races, I'm going to get really good, and it only gets easier. My goodness, yeah, there, there's a lot to, to unpack in what you just said. Um, the, um, the first being, you know, when, you, when you're going running through the cemetery and that, and that reminder um, – I loved this saying. I heard it on um, the, uh, what is it called? Um, the Crooked Butterfly. Um, his name is Josh, and he is, he, he goes on to like Trail Runner Nation at times. He's got this great mentality, and he, he really comes up with some, some really good just one-liners. And he said, own your dash. And what he meant by that is when your tombstone is made, you're going to have two dates and you're going to have a dash in between. And what you did in between is what people are going to remember you for. So you got to own that dash. You got to do everything from, you know, when you're born to when you die, you got to make the best of this life. And as you said, you know, you want to leave lasting memories, you know, not only for your kids, but for your family. And you want them to remember things that you did, which is incredible. And that's, you know, you're making memories for them. You know, the same thing in our family, we're trying to make memories for our kids. And, you know, to those that are listening, it's, you know, when you go out there, make them a part of that, you know, make them a part of, of your journey so that they see who is the real man or who is the real woman behind this name. And I, I love that. I'd love that you took that into consideration and already saw that, that, you know, you want to make sure you're making the most of this life. 
that's tremendous. Um, the second thing that, that hit me was, you know, when, when you talked about our coaching relationship, our coaching relationship is different than, you know, a, a vast majority of the, of the folks I coach. You have experiences, you have ideas, you know what your body is craving, whether it be speed or pacing. And I compliment what you're feeling based on what you're telling me. I think I could use this to work on right now. This is what my weakness lies in. You can feel that and tell me. And then I fill that gap with, you know, my knowledge of what's going to give you the best adaptation to bump you up a fitness level. And it's tremendous because <laughs> all the time we see threshold increase, threshold increase. We're getting these threshold increases along the way. So your journey has been tremendous because of your communication. And that's the the thing that a lot of people miss with a coaching relationship is that communication saying, you know, like I do feel strong here, but I feel like I could use some work here. And you giving me that feedback has made our relationship so much better. And, you know, yeah, sometimes we have to rein it in. <laughs> and that's just like everybody, you know, we have people that want to go out and do, you know, eight hour long runs, which, you know, sometimes it's not the best time. But, you know, that's that's part of the, the whole experience and working with each other, making sure that uh, not only am I keeping you accountable, but you're keeping me accountable. And so I think when a coach and an athlete can have that type of relationship, it's going to flourish just as your ability has, you know, you're getting faster and faster. And, and we get over this Achilles and, you know, get you to Chicago. I'm definitely excited to see what happens. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, having that motivation. Like what, what motivates you, yours being your kids, mine too, you know, like it, it, there wasn't much time that I was out at hard rock that I wasn't thinking about my kids, not having them there killed me. But at the same time, you know, it was just, it, it's a, it's a powerful thing to have that motivation, that why. Um, so I, I totally agree with you. You know, what is motivating to you? Usually I have a picture of them on my thigh that you know, I can look down on. Usually I put the picture upside down and I can look down and see them. And, you know, there it is. Like, there's my why, you know, it's, it's these two kids that have made the most difference in my life. So I, uh, those, you, you said a lot just in a short time frame there. And I just wanted to, to unpack that a little bit from my perspective. Do you want to add anything to that? Well, I just want to give thanks and praise. You know, the, the running is a metaphor for life for me. It teaches me all the lessons that I need to know and that I struggle with. I mean, one of the things that I just love about this running community, whether it's on the roads or it's in the woods, if you're willing to reach out, people will go out of their way to help you. I mean, Ivo Binoff, who now lives in Colorado, this guy's a 228 marathoner, and he used to do speed work with me in his free time. I mean, he gets no value from running 30s with Martin, but he would, he would do everything to go out of his way. The Saturday morning group I run with, they're all 250 and below marathoners. I call them the faster bastards. But, you know, they keep inviting me back. They say, as long as you bring the uh, popsicles, we'll let you run with us. And I run with them every Saturday morning, and they're happy to see me. And they're like, that old guy, he just will not quit. But they're <laughs> the greatest guys, and that's Justin, Jeremy, and um, – and, uh, Golly, I'm struggling. Yeah, Justin, Jeremy, and Matt. And then the ultra runners. I mean, we got two great ones besides Greg Little, who got me involved with you, Eric and Bobby. And they've been just so kind to me. I, I literally watch them, what they do, and I just copy it because it works. And so I've just found a lot of love within the running community. I didn't find that with golf. I didn't find that other places at the bars and stuff. These are lifelong friends that are constantly, Hey, what's going on? What are you doing? Come run. So I'm very grateful for the people that have surrounded me in this community. That's, that's for sure. Yeah, it, it does. It's, it, we have a tremendous community and, and you find your friends within that community. And then, you know, I'm, I'm sure at the Stevest, you, <laughs> you had some of those community members there. Um, which, you know, if you want to talk a little bit more about like, you know, some of those things that you learned at the Stevest, um, you had mentioned that early um, that, you know, there are some some lessons that you took away. If you want to share some of those and we can kind of go through those. Well, it's 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 something that I've learned. I mean, if, if I could just give a shout out to myself, my best hundred today and there, hopefully there'll be some better ones was when I broke. Uh, I think it was 1637 at Umstead, which you just ran It's seven loops or eight loops, 
Well, I'm a big believer. I have seen over time with myself and others that once you get really depleted, it's hard to make decisions. And so I had literally eight bags in my cooler and I would just grab a bag, refill my vest, put the bottle in and go. And I did the same thing at Steve's. I never, I went up to the table to say, here I am. But then I went over to my cooler. I saw bag one, bag two, bag three. I would grab bag two. I'd literally put it in there, eat what I needed and go out. So I was, I was uh, at off course, maybe three minutes each loop. And I actually passed the number one runner, the young guy that ultimately beat me, Drew. And I hollered him, hey, don't let this old man beat you. And he had been over there 20 some minutes. So I'm just a believer in control what you can control. And the only thing I can control in this world, Aaron, is my attitude, my willingness to work. And so if I just set things up where I don't have to think at these long events, I am so much better. I remember when I ran Penn Hody a couple of years back, and I think I got sixth or seventh. But I'm, again, I'm not bragging. But I remember telling J.O. and my buddy who went and crewed, I said, we don't need to have any discussion after 50 miles because, one, I can't do it. And, two, you're going to see a thousand mile stare. Your only job is to fill up my vest, put stuff in my mouth, say chew, and then tell me I look great and push me <laughs> off. And he did that. He said, you know, I couldn't make a decision. What do you want to eat? He knew we had everything I needed to eat. He'd literally say, put this in your mouth, put this in your hand. And then he'd fill up my bottles and I'd go. And And I would tell you, I know I didn't have more than 10 minutes that whole race at an aid station. I mean, I'm literally in 30 seconds an hour because I can take and chew. So those are the things I have to do because I'm not the fastest or most gifted. One thing I'm super proud of um, about the Stevens Mornings thing is I didn't trip. And my stride, and, and that happened just by chance, an angel. So at, at the Boogie Marathon, which is known to be the hottest and maybe the hardest marathon in the state, it's done end of June. It's just so hot at night. Um, somebody just happened to videotape the start, and there was like 20 seconds of me running just because I was second behind Ivo. Ivo broke, uh, broke six hours for 50 miles, which is phenomenal. He's my hero. But somebody videotaped that, and Ivo called me from Colorado the next day after he got home and said, I got something important to talk about. And he sent me the video, and this guy is getting ready to be in the world championships, and he's called a slow old guy in North Carolina and said, look at this stride. You're not using your knees. You're the human scissor. Well, I thought because um, – I thought because I had a high cadence, like 195, 200, that I was doing everything right. He says, you're not using your knee. And that's why I've been pulling hamstrings. So we've been working. And because of that, like when we used to go out to Yari and do fast 20 miles, I averaged four to five falls every time. <laughs> and it's just because that lead foot would catch something because I didn't raise up the foot. And now – I did the Stevis, and I mean, I've been focusing on high knees, so I think I'm only getting better, and it's because I'm willing to take direction. Yep. Uh, but yep. the Stevis, I think I did a great job of keeping the body cold as much as possible, and then um, I didn't run out of water, and we can I'll talk a little bit later about the things my must-haves I must have, but I think just preparing up front and thinking, what do I need? So I don't have to do any thinking once the race gets there, because I know as I get tired, I'll lose my ability to reason. Does that make sense? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. No, I, I was, I was right there. I, you know, I, I told uh, um, my pacer, Sam, you know, I said, when I get to you, you're making decisions. <laughs> like, you know, don't ask me because I'm not going to be able to think as like you are making decisions and telling me to eat <laughs> and I'll just try to find something that's going to go down. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about because you just get so tired. You're, you're mentally, you're just so fried and you know, it's just, you can't, you can't do anything. You can't do simple math. That's for sure. <laughs> yep. The other things that I think running as a metaphor for life for me, as I heard this years ago that you can reach all your goals if you'll help other people reach their goals. And if you follow me on Strava, you'll see a lot of easy days at 10 30s 
really slow. Like I did a trail run with the new runner recently. It was 15 minutes. Now for some of your fast runners, they would swear I was walking, but I was jogging. And I just believe I get so much pleasure out of seeing new runners bloom. Um, you just can't imagine how much that means to me. So I have no problem. I had somebody join us, um, Curtis recently, he joined us uh, for the morning group and he said, I'm a little bit intimidated about running with you. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, I see some of your speed work you're doing and it's really fast. And I said, Curtis, but you're not looking at all the other days. 80 to 85 percent of my running is so slow and I wish it was slower. And he's just been amazed how slow I'm willing to run. I have to run slow to allow my body to catch up to the intense work I'm trying to do two or three times a week. So I have no, like today, I did a 930 and I almost felt like it was a little fast. <laughs> um, but, but I'm okay with that. Where I went wrong the early years, I really believe, is the gray zone. I stayed in the gray zone where I would run. So right now, my goal, just to, just to kind of, not to brag again, but my marathon is, goal marathon is 630, 629. I would run every run during the week other than speed days at 7.30, 60 seconds over. Well, what ended up happening is I was too tired to ever recover because I ran too fast. And then when it was time to step on the accelerator and really push, I couldn't do it. And so because, because just I've been doing this a while, I finally learned that I've got to run it. The days that count are the speed work days for me. So I have no problem running 1030s. If you can tell me I can run 550s all day long, you know, in speed work to get to 630. I have no problem doing that. And I see a lot of folks uh, really spend too much time in the gray zone. Unfortunately, my running groups have heard me whine and nag them so long. They're kind of starting to get it, too. And they're actually making big strides. So that's just something I, I've learned about over time. Yep. Uh, that's something that you and I discussed, right? That's as you got started with me too, right? Because yeah. all right, why are the easy days so important? Why do we take them so easy? Um, and you, you know, you put it succinctly, it's because we want to emphasize the hard days. Um, it's just like Matt Fitzgerald in his book, 80, 20, you know, 80% hard or 80% easy and 20% hard. And it just makes those, you know, 20% hard days that much better because you know, you're making your adaptations on your easy days. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's a great point. Um, the other things that just come across why running is a metaphor for me is it rewards consistency. I get back what I put in. I paced a lot of marathons and I always ask folks before we start my pace group, whatever it is, how many of you were running at least, if it's a marathon, ran at least 13 miles a week at this pace you want to do? And very few hands go up. I just don't believe in running fairies that the day of the race, you're going to get some magical 15 second bonus. I've never seen it happen. So I'm a big believer. As long as I'm consistent, I will get back what I put in. Ivo actually even believes that if I want to run a marathon at 630, I should be over the split of the whole week in whatever sections should be running actually 26 the last five weeks at that pace. So over the three quality runs, we're going to get 26 in or you got to be close. So, you know, I, I know that I need to run that pace, but to do that, I've got to slow down on the easy days, but there is nothing as refreshing as me as going out and running fast on a track and knowing exactly what I did. It is honest. <laughs> it is honest. And whether it's good or bad, it allows me to know exactly where I'm at so that I generally don't blow up in races because I know where I'm at, you know, and I don't think that I'm going to get some gift from the running ferry and actually be able to run faster than I should. <laughs> so that's another thing. And it also running teaches me balance with the family. I have to have balance. I can't spell moderation or practice it. I mean, <laughs> I will I will run in the morning. I'll run at lunch. And then it's interesting, I needed to start cross-training even more to get ready for Chicago. Somebody came up to me out of the blue the other day and said, hey, I'd like to start going to the gym. Are you a member of the local gym, uh, Planet Fitness? And I said, yeah. And they said, would you go with me at 5 o'clock for 30 minutes? And I'm like, sure, I will. So now I'm in the gym even more. 
you know, my kids are all grown. My wife's got her career. So it's no problem for me to devote 30 minutes and it's actually helping me. So whether I'm helping that person, they're helping me at the end of the day, I'm getting stronger and that person's getting more fit. It is just such a win-win. So it's just, I, I constantly see blessings into my life. When I had cancer and I was walking around on crutches in 2000. 17, a, a overweight guy named Jay Owen came up to me at work and said, I heard you're a jogger. And I was frustrated and mad at the world. I couldn't run. I just had surgery. And I said, yeah. He said, well, hey, when you get back to jogging, can I jog with you? And I said, sure. But I said, I got two rules. If you ever want to run with me, Aaron, these are my two rules and two rules only. One, you can't complain about the weather. I don't want to hear about it. It does me good. And I said, the other thing is you can't complain how hard it is. And what I see, that's why I get so motivated when I run with new runners. They are struggling so hard out there and they're grinning. And I always tell them, it's just as hard for me as it is you. We're just going different paces. But those are my two rules. If you complain about the weather, I don't want to hear it. And if you complain how hard it is, I don't want to hear it. And I will <laughs> never push anybody in the run. I just complaining for me doesn't work. Old Ben Hogan, the golfer, used to say, half the people don't care and the other half wish it was worse. And I don't know where I'm at in there, but I <laughs> don't want to deal with complainers. So I don't. So all of anybody that runs with me, we just don't complain, but we talk about what's important, families and faith and what's going on in our lives. Very rarely do we talk about running or something like that. So it's just an avenue for me to get to know people. And you had mentioned um, inserting more cross training. Um, you also implement a, a good amount of strength training. Um, why don't you touch on that too? Well, I just, you know, I, a lot of my, a lot of my problems are coming from strength issues. So I've been doing just barbells, a barbell on each side, and uh, one of my favorite runs is tomorrow, which I'm going to do. It's a strength run we do on Tuesdays. It's a seven-mile run, and every mile we stop and either do 25 lunges, 25 squats, 25 split squats. So we're just constantly working the muscles, and then I like to come back on Thursday or Friday and do some kind of uh, single-leg focus from Jay Dahari's book, uh, but I can do all that with uh, barbells and stuff like that. So it doesn't have to be fancy again. It's just a matter of doing it, just getting out there and making it happen. So you'll see me put two barbells on my shoulders and I'll start doing squats and stuff like that. I mean, nothing revolutionary, but I have to do it for it to count and help me. Like yeah. I'm going to put yeah. in the work. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, the book he's referring to is Running Rewired. Um, I'll put that in the show notes. I've referred to it countless times on this podcast because I think it's a great resource. And I, I'm sure all of my athletes are, are sick of hearing <laughs> about Jay DeSherry and uh, his uh, his hip circuit and <laughs> all of the tremendous things that that he does and um, you know the tools he provides for runners. So, uh, but if you don't know much about um, Jay and uh, and his work, he has a great website which I'll also post on the uh, the show notes because he has a tremendous amount of resources for. For us runners. When, uh, when, when I do use the weight, the machines at the gym, I always do single legs. So people follow me laugh because I'll be like doing stuff like squats and stuff with only 45 pounds, but it'll be single leg. I, I just believe we get a lot more benefit from doing single leg stuff. And like when, when I do deadlifts, I do, I do a single leg with the other toe barely touching in the back. So just... Just trying to focus because what happens with me is I've got one leg that's stronger than the other. And when I use those machines with both legs at the same time, what ends up happening is the stronger leg does all the work and the weaker one really doesn't get the benefit. Totally. Yes. Um, and you are also um, a tremendous um, <laughs> a person that, that has um, a diverse, I guess, um, or – uh, a sponge for learning, I guess we should say, because, you know, you're, you're sending me podcasts all the time, which, you know, you and I probably listen to <laughs> many of the same podcasts uh, and you, you know, newsletters, you read the newsletters and, um, you know, send articles and stuff my way. Um, many of which I, you know, I, I'm also reading too. Um, what, uh, what pushes you to, to, you know, to, to want to learn so much extra? 
well, I, I want to get better. You know, my, my PR right now is 256. God willing, I'm willing to do the work. I mean, I'm really shooting for a 250 at 55 years old in at Chicago. And you know what? Here's the great thing. If I don't get it in Chicago, I'll get it in the spring. I can't control what happens in Chicago. I haven't been able to put more than 60 days together without an injury for a while, but I feel like the high knee is going to fix it. And if I just stop being stupid and trying to do two speed days, two speed workouts on the same day, I'll be fine. So the only thing I can't control is how hard I'm willing to work and the consistency. And I got that buddy. So, you know, that that's why I want to do this. I don't think, you know, I really do think I have an expiration date. I, I don't know. You know, I think I can get faster, but it's getting harder. I'll tell those 40 something year olds and, 30s and 20s don't believe it as I didn't, but I am working harder today than I was when I was 40 years old for recovery, stretching, strength, and everything. I mean, it, it used to be so easy to what I'm doing. I've never worked this hard in my life, and I'm getting results, but I'm just saying it's not coming easy. And uh, so that's that's the sense of urgency. And that's why I've kind of, I've not run anything over 43 miles in a long in a couple of years because it just takes so much for marathon training i mean yeah. even this 43 milers i didn't train well for a week week and a half and so i mean i look back on it and say i love the people at the stevens but in theory i i probably shouldn't have done that i mean i i don't get that much benefit from just wearing my body out like that i would have been better off running with the faster bastards on saturdays and <laughs> you know getting back into my routine on monday um, sure. My weekly routine is a uh, pace day on Monday. So that's the day that we want to do marathon or faster. And generally you and I work on some 5k, 10k trying to increase my VO2. And then I try to do two easy runs on Tuesday and then two easy runs on Wednesday, double. And I try to make the lunch run at least 90 minutes to try to, and again, that's fully aerobic. I'm not pushing pace. And then, Thursday is uh, another quality run and then an easy trail run on Friday and then a quality long run on Saturday with two and a half hours and some marathon work. And then, you know, if I have anything left, a 90 minute easy trail run on Sunday. Um, so that gets me 80 to 90 miles each week. But I have no problem if I'm worn out not doing a Sunday run because come Monday I need to get back on the horse again. So that's kind of been where we're at. Um, yep. so I look yep. forward to getting back there. And aside from, you know, keeping the easy runs easy, um, what would you attribute some of your key recovery components to? I am the biggest believer in hydration this time of year. If I am out more than 40 minutes, I am carrying a collapsible bottle. I've got the collapsible bottles, um, that hold, I think, 17 ounces. I carry one of them all the time and also always have BCAAs in there. It tastes good and it makes me recover better. I'm a big believer. How I hydrate today, it will dictate how I run and feel tomorrow. So I am just the biggest believer in hydration. Uh, I see my buddies going out without it for 90 minutes and I'm just, I just don't get it. It just doesn't work for this old body. Maybe I could do it when I was 35 or 40, but I really have to work on that. The other thing is um, my diet has changed. Uh, I maybe only eat meat once or twice a week to get the fair and iron, but I'm mostly like I've got a two pound salad every day. I eat a lot of salads and I get most of my protein from black bean. I have black beans and chickpeas in my salad every single day. Um, in fact, let me show you. This was the container that I've already eaten. I fill this container up every day to the top. It weighs over two and a half pounds, but it's just I think I think it gets keeps the inflammation down. Um, so those are the things between diet and uh, just hydration. Um, I really believe. And the other thing, my must haves is chest heart rate band. I know there's a lot of folks out there running land that hate those damn things because they cut and all, and I think it's just something I have to play with, and I put Vaseline on her, but I think it's mission critical on the easy days, because I know, like today, I ran up 9.30 on a hilly course, 
my heart rate was 110. If I see that thing at 116 and 118, I know I'm not recovered. So I, I care more about the chest heart rate band on the easy days than the hard days. The hard days, they're high. Yeah. You know, and some days I get too high because I run too fast, believe it or not. And then I, it hurt, calls me. But the easy day. So I do not run without a chest rate heart band because I need to know. And unfortunately, the, the watches just are not accurate. Um, I agree. I agree. What, what that, band are you using? What? Which band are you using? Uh, the Garmin one. Garmin. I, mean, I, yeah. I don't know if there's a difference, but I do know that uh, it, consistently. It yeah. I, I have uh, Wahoo because Coros doesn't make a a chest strap, so um, I use the Wahoo. But yeah, I did the same. I had the I had a recovery run today, um, you know, and I just wanted to make sure I didn't go above zone two. So just you know, I just kept kept an eye on it, and anytime I felt like I was you know picking up the pace, I looked down just to make sure I wasn't you know going zone three, and you just kept it nice and easy, uh, you know. And and you do that, you're gonna recover so much faster. Um, you know, and again, make those adaptations that you're looking to make, um, you know, and you'll feel so much better. So, uh, not to say you can't get into zone three, but you know, um, zone three, you're getting more, um, into, you know, aerobic run, not really recovery, but, and that's a good way to tell, you know, like how is your aerobic fitness? If you can't stay in zone two at a slower pace, you really need to work those, that, that zone two aerobic. I mean, you shouldn't be going up to zone three just yet. If you can't, do an easy run in zone two, it, it tells you about your aerobic fitness. So, you know, keep an eye on that when, uh, when, and I'm not talking specifically to you, Martin, <laughs> cause you know this, but you know, to the listeners, if you do get a chest strap, you know, watch on your recovery days, make sure that you're staying zone two. And if you have a hard time doing it, you need to work on that aerobic base a little further. So I, uh, I, I run 3,500 to 4,000 miles a year. So I feel like my base is pretty good. So I don't see the benefit. I mean, I, other than that 90-minute run on Wednesdays, I generally don't even get into zone three. I stay in zone two and even zone one, and I'm fine with that. The other thing that I've found this year that I am in love with, and I, I do not get any benefit from this, and I'm not alive, but my buddy Eric turned me on to this. It's called SIS. It's a hydro gel. So what I love about it is it's half water, half gel, and so – you know, this time of year, we just don't have enough water on us. So this gel goes down very easy. It's an isotonic energy gel, but I get the benefits of a gel and it's half water and I don't have to drink after it. I can swallow it and move on. So I'm using these this time of year. If you go onto their website, and sign up, you'll never pay full price. I get 50% coupons off every week. So anyway, if people don't want to carry water and they need to use a gel, this cyst gel, which is big with triathletes, um, I've been real happy with. I probably will switch away from it once it gets winter and hydration is not, uh, not a big thing. The other thing that I swear by, and this is something Bobby got me on, um, is these compression waist belts. And what these do, they fit almost like spanks, but they got pockets all the way around, Aaron. <laughs> and so I wear these on every run. Like the Stevis, I carry this. I carry two 18-ounce bottles. I had all my gels. And then I had a, a phone in the back so I could listen to your podcast. <laughs> so I love this thing. I don't want to use my hands when I'm running, whether it be marathon pacing, whether it be ultras. I need to have my hands free for balance. Yeah. And I yep. just swear by these things. I love them. Cool. And then if I need bottles, I have the Ultra Spire um, double bottle on my back hips that I'll use. But I really believe in these compression sports. Uh, Naked Band is one I have. I have a couple of these. I got a couple at home, but I yeah. love them. And you can actually put your, uh, you can actually put, they've got loops here to put your poles in, believe it or not. But I swear yeah. by these things. Yeah. I don't have to wear a pack, a heavy pack heavy hot pack goes around my waist and it, i've just this is a must-have for me every day well, i uh i will put both in the uh the show notes the sis website and the uh compressed sports waist belts i'll put a link to those in the show notes um i use the new um goo liquid energy at hard rock and i just reviewed it in my newsletter um and just to the point of, that you were making and kind of what we were talking about earlier when, when we talked about getting so late in the race and, 
you know, that you can get that, like, I will call it fatigue because you're just constantly swallowing gels with these liquid gels, you know, either cis or goo, whoever it may be. And, and just like you, I have no <laughs> gain by mentioning goo, but the, um, they just go down so easy because as you said, they're 50% liquid. Um, and it, you know, it was like, like I said, late in the race, it wasn't like I was having to squeeze down a gel and kind of force it down. You just drink, you know, and it's kind of like tailwind in that regard, or, um, you know, or the Roctane drink uh, you're getting a gel though, you know, and it's, it's just in more of a liquid form. So, um, I, I really liked, um, I don't know if you have a favorite flavor in cis. Mine was the lemonade. Um, and they actually had it at the aid stations out there as well, which was great. Um, the lemonade flavor for me was, it was so easy to get down. Um, the only downside was, I, that one didn't have caffeine. You know, I, I talked about that. I needed some caffeine and I just didn't have enough caffeine in my gels, but, um, but yeah, the cis product, I, I've, I, numerous people have, uh, have talked about that, um, and have been using it. So, um, like I said, I'll put that in the show notes as well. Thank you. It's got the same consistency as the Morton gels or the okay. Martin gels. Yeah. Just a fourth the price and they do have caffeine and they got citrus flavor. So, right. Uh, the other things that I, I guess my must have in the winter time, once it gets cool, I just have to have wool socks. So that's just one thing I was thinking of. And I buy a lot of my stuff from running warehouse just because I don't have a local shop where I live that does a good job with it. And they've always got a good product at a good price. Fair enough. Those are kind of my, my things. Okay. I, I, one, one last thing. And again, I get nothing from this, but this is a crazy deal. So <laughs> I, I read years ago about Reebok being purchased by Puma. And they make their own, they, they have all versions, sort of like Skechers, all version levels of shoes. But Reebok's Marathon performance shoes are called float rides. And they've got they've got this thing here, and it actually has the pre-bax foam, which is what Nike used in the original Vaporfly until they trademarked it with their own name. But right now you can go home. So it's a seven-ounce shoe, which for a trainer is great. I've got over 400 miles and I cannot wear this thing out. <laughs> and if you go on Amazon right now, the Reebok Float Ride Run Fast 2.0 with the Prebax foam is $39. Whoa. It's an eight millimeter drop. So if you're looking for a tank um, trainer, I, I can't think of a better deal ever. <laughs> a fantastic shoe on Amazon, $39. I just, I bought two more pair, but anyway, I just, for yeah, trainer, I, they're fantastic. And just for those that, that scream in at the, uh, their headphones, um, the Reebok was purchased by Adidas, which is where, you know, Adidas obviously has their boost foam. So Reebok took the proprietary blend that they're using. That's and, right. It's not Puma, it's Adidas. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, 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 no worries. I just, <laughs> just clarifying, you know, because, you know, there's those people that are listening to the podcast. It's uh, Adidas! <laughs> but, but, uh, well, what's interesting is now Adidas is, is, is going over to the, is trying some other things other than Boost. There was a real infighting amongst Reebok and Adidas who should get this pre backs foam, and yeah. Reebok got it. So it's a great shoe for the money. And it's 39 bucks, and it's an 8 millimeter drop. Yep. If you're not happy, I'll buy it back from you. <laughs> I've, I've got like 11 runners in that, and they all thank me and go, it was just crazy. So it's a good deal. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I sent you guys a, a link uh, in the weekly email um, to the team um, about the uh, Doctors of Running uh, podcast. Those guys, I mean, their most recent podcast for anybody that doesn't, they also do a YouTube video so you can see what they're, you know, what they're holding up in the shoe and everything and what they're talking about. But they do an in-depth dive into specific shoes. Like, you know, one podcast may just be on one shoe and their take on it, what they felt, how it compares to other shoes. This past, they did a review of all the super shoes that have come out this year. Um, and it was really interesting to hear, you know, what they, and cause they talked about in, you know, in great length about the Adidas, um, and the, the, you know, now they have a few, Adidas has a few different super shoes, just like Nike does. Um, and they talked about the Saucony, uh, the Endorphin Pro and the new New Balance, uh, the Fuel Cell, I think it's called too. Uh, but anyhow, they, they go in and they talk about these different shoes and the technology and, and you know, how it feels, who it's best for. It's, you know, it's a really good podcast. I just want to kind of, you know, I'll put it in the show notes, too, because I think it's a really good resource for runners because they really geek out 
on shoes kind of tell you, you know, who it's best for, who it works for, what, you know, what purposes it would serve. So, um, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll put that in the show notes. Um, but Martin, man, uh, anything else that you want to add? No, I've, I've told you kind of what I try to do, why I do it and how I do it. I, you know, I just, I'm grateful for all my friends that run with me and it just, I, you know, I've got a t-shirt that says I run so I don't punch people. I got a very stressful job. So, I mean, it just, it is so nice to leave at lunch each day and go run for an hour to 90 minutes and then come back and work. So it just breaks up my day and, my wife will often say when I haven't been running much for whatever reason, you haven't been running much. So she can tell it just, it's sort of my Prozac and it just gives me a lot of joy. And I love nothing more than to get on the trails and just bounce around and see new places. So. I, I admire you. I admire your work ethic. Um, I, you know, I, I can't wait to, to get you through this Achilles thing and, and, you know, set you on the course to Chicago because, I'm um, excited to see what you can do. Uh, I thank you for sharing all of this, Martin, for, you know, all of the the tidbits that you've given us here. Um, the show notes are going to be pretty jam packed because you, <laughs> you shared a lot of stuff here. So I really do appreciate that. And thank you for, for all you do, you know, bringing new runners into the sport and sharing this, this great sport of ours with others. All right, Aaron. Thanks. And I look forward to continue to work with you. Well, thank you once again, Martin. You know, running is is a great metaphor for life, and thank you for all you shared there. Uh, gonna have a packed full uh, show notes <laughs> with all the things that Martin went over. Uh, really cool. Um, so appreciate Martin for for really bringing all of that to the table and and sharing that with us and his story. Um, congratulations to him. Uh, as I always do, I wish him luck, uh, at, at, uh, Chicago. <laughs> Obviously I am more in touch with him on a daily basis, but, uh, you can reach out to, to Martin. He is on Strava and social media. Uh, you can find him on Facebook and, uh, and Strava. So thank you again, Martin. Um, some really cool things going on. Uh, I would like to share about the, um, hellbender. Uh, Hellbender actually has quite a few updates. Um, we are, uh, well, we've got all of our permits in. There is a new Facebook page for, uh, designated to the Hellbender race. It is the Hellbender 100 race, uh, page on Facebook. There is also a Instagram page. Um, and that is Hellbender 100 race. So at Hellbender 100 race, I'll put all that in the show notes. Um, and as I mentioned last week, we've got a, uh, a brand new podcast for Hellbender. Uh, we will release the first episode this Saturday. Uh, that would be August 21st at uh, 5 a.m. So uh, you'll be able to find that on uh, podbean.com. If you go to the Facebook page, um, I will put it in the, uh, I'll put a post on the pace on the uh, Hellbender Facebook page. I'll try to share it everywhere I can. Um, interviewing members of the Run 828 Foundation. The Run 828 Foundation is the foundation that um, I created, I think back in 2014 or somewhere around there. Um, and, uh, you know, created that so that we could create a trail club, the North Carolina mountain trail running club and, uh, and the hellbender itself. So, um, we talk, uh, with the, the current board members, um, of which I am not a part. And we talk, you know, what, uh, what the distinguishing, um, or what, um, separating, from the foundation has meant, um, you know, for Hellbender and, um, and moving forward. So uh, I hope you'll join and listen to that podcast and uh, we will get it up on all of the, you know, the podcast listening platforms as fast as I can. Um, I think, uh, I'll, I'll probably have them up on the podcast platforms, um, by this weekend, it takes them a little while to approve. So, um, you know, I will, I'll be working on that and getting them up on the podcast platform, but stay tuned for that. That's super exciting. Um, and, um, other than that, um, you know, so personally racing wise, I uh, signed up for the local cradle to grave 30 K, um, bunch of friends locally are running it. It will be great to see, you know, the community of which, um, I love here in Western North Carolina. Uh, we will be having uh, a great time out there I'm running with, um, you know, I've got, um, uh, Sheridan Byers. He's a good friend that I'm always training with. Um, Jonathan Iback, who I just ran with today. Um, Jonathan just did, I don't know if you saw on my social media, but, uh, I posted on uh, Instagram and Facebook. Jonathan is an amazing artist. Um, he does our sub 24 hour awards for the hellbender. Um, he, um, he basically, 
kind of cuts out uh, uh, shapes uh, of wood, and then he he paints them, stains them, and um, you know puts uh, uh, even engraves them. Now it's incredible. So um, you know I'll, I'll put his. Uh, um, his social media handle in the show notes. Um, he did an amazing job. He created uh, the shape of a bear and put the um, Pisgah National Forest logo that you would see on trailhead signs on the bear. It's just super cool. And he he did like a, a mimic of the uh, Pisgah uh, signs, which are, uh, he just like I said does an amazing job. So check those out. There are he does sell them. Uh, they are eighty six dollars. Uh, and like I said, hand done. You know, it's it's not like a mass production. You know, he does it all by hand. So check him out, um, and I'll put that stuff in the show notes as well. So, um, and let's see. Um, yeah, October, uh, we've got uh, the uh, the Naturalist 50K. Um, and I was talking to um, one of my athletes, Drew Antonis. Uh, I may have mentioned this. He's planning on racing, so it should be a great race out there. Uh, I was sorry to hear that Canyon um, – would not be joining us, uh, Kenyon Woodard. He is heading out west to try Seattle for a bit, which is super cool. Um, and let's see, what else? Um, and then uh, Sky to Summit. Be racing Sky to Summit in November. And signed up also for Black Canyons, uh, the 100K. So obviously put in for Western States Lottery again this year. And see if we get in. If I get in, it'll be uh, Black Canyons will be a great precursor and warm up race for Western. If not, then uh, you know it will be a qualifier <laughs> for the next lottery for Western states. So um, just waiting my turn there. Uh, can't you know? Can't wait to hopefully get in at some point. Uh, been putting in there since 2016. I know once again, you know, there are people that have been putting in a bit longer than me. So um, you know, it's uh, it's it's all good. So. Um, other things, uh, let's see, uh, we are midway through August. So, um, the, uh, as I always say, the newsletter, you can check that out on my website. Um, all old podcast episodes are also on my website, mrrunningpains.com. You can reach out to me through that website. Uh, the show notes will have all my social media handles, um, as well as if you'd like to donate through Patreon to keep, um, not only this, uh, this podcast going, uh, my YouTube channel going and, uh, the, um, the newsletter itself. Um, that would be great if you can. Uh, but if you can't, please, you know, just like share, subscribe, all of those good things really help other people find this podcast. So, um, really appreciate you guys for that. And, um, yeah, I hope you guys are doing great. Um, you can hear my voice. I'm excited. You got a lot going on. Cross country just sh- started for the kids. So been going out, you know, getting sharing uh sharing this great sport of ours with the the youngest generation of runners um so fun so i i'm i'm amped for that um coaching super busy right now uh i am not taking clients for a while here i would suspect after september i may have some room again as some athletes finish up their goal races um so if you're looking for a coach and are thinking of joining um you know perhaps uh in uh, september or october just reach out to me see if i'll have space Coming. I know right now I do not. I am full at the moment. Um, actually, <laughs> kind of beyond capacity. So, um, but I sincerely appreciate that. Um, but again, you know, if you're looking for the future, reach out. We'll see what we can do. Um, really, really appreciate it, guys. Um, just spoke with Patrick Regan um, over text. He's out in Colorado um, at Leadville. He's going to be supporting Ian Sherman in the Leadville 100. Um, I've got one of my runners that are that is racing, um, Howard Chobb. I hope he does great. So good luck to you, sir, if you hear this before the race. Um, and um, uh, Patrick and I are going to get together for a podcast. Um, we've been talking about kind of reviewing East Coast races and talking about what's going on here. Um, so I think we're going to start trying to make that maybe like a monthly podcast um, in which, you know, we just kind of go over um, what's going on here on the East Coast. Um, as we all know, <laughs> we, there's, a, there's a lot that transpires and we just want to bring attention to some, some of the great runners that are here on the East Coast. So, um, you know, if you have guest ideas, podcast ideas, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, always love hearing hearing from you and hearing reviews. Um, I was so humbled by how many people reached out about the, uh, the hunt Brumby episode. Um, hunt is an amazing, um, person and you could hear just, uh, his 
love for others and the sport in that in that interview. And so many people have complimented on that interview. Uh, I, you know, Hunt is a tremendous person, and he did something amazing. So I am glad that we were able to bring that, and Hunt was able to bring such a um, a great um, presence to the podcast. So thank you guys for all of those compliments, and uh, and once again, thank you Hunt for for being on. Um, and until next week, guys, just keep running, stay safe, and I'll talk to you next time.